Welcome to another episode of DD on the Spot. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Johnson. Before we get into it with our guest here today, I'd like to remind everyone that if you enjoy this content, to please give a like and subscribe down below. I'd greatly appreciate it. We have Kathy on the podcast. She's coming to us all the way from Fargo, North Dakota, where I just have to point this out every single time I have a guest on from Fargo. That is where the movie Fargo is set in. It's not set in Minnesota. So every time everyone's like, oh, you have the Minnesota accent. I was like, it's actually Fargo. It's in North Dakota. It's just right across. It's just right across, you know, but but still. But she's on here to share her health and fitness journey, you know, discuss all things health and fitness. And as we can see, she's got her gym in the background, which is a very awesome touch that I love to have. We've only had that about a dozen times on this podcast. But most importantly, she's our current guest. Kathy, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm I'm excited. You first messaged me a couple of years ago, and I I'm excited we're finally getting to do this. <laughs> no worries at all. I've had a few of those too where they're like, they like message me like a year later. They're like, hey, I just saw this. And I was like, oh, hey, not a problem at all. No, I literally still go back when I'm searching for people to come on. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, I actually messaged him like three years ago. So I was like, oh, yeah, well, you know. But hey, no, no worries at all. And I ask this to every single guest that I have on first, what is the weather like in Fargo today? I mean, it is about the best day you can get here today. No wind, which is for North Dakota is actually crazy. Um, no wind. It's sunny. Probably about 70. No snow. Anytime there's no snow, especially in June, you know, being from the upper moon. No, but I know it's the same here where I mean, like yesterday's perfect and today's going to be perfect. I mean, I'm going to go out for a walk right after I'm done talking to you because it's just, it is absolutely perfect outside, but I don't want to depress everyone else that's, you know, not having the best weather days. So why don't you give us your backstory first off on what really inspired and motivated you to get in shape and how that led to where you're currently at right now? I actually am someone who, I couldn't tell you the exact year, but I have a, I should have found it for this, but I thought I have a picture of myself when I was maybe seven. Um, I had gotten something called get in shape girl. And it was like this aerobic poster that had like these different exercises you were supposed to do. And it had a cassette tape, little non-weighted dumbbells, like a headband, like leg warmers, you know, back in the eighties, not to date myself, but um, my parents got me involved in sports very, very young. I did sports all through high school and college. And I knew I wanted to be involved. I, I knew it made me feel good. And I enjoyed the competition of it. And it just it has always been a part of my life. And I know that's not everyone's story. I know a lot of people, um, co- you know, come from all aspects of it. But the way it makes you feel is usually what ties us all together. And I love that about the fitness journey right? How you feel about you on the inside, not just the outside. But um, I got into competing. Um, Like I said, I did sports all through college. And then once I got out of college, I was a personal trainer in a gym and I loved that, but I knew I was searching for somewhere to put that competitive spirit out yet. And I believe this was like early, early, early 2000s. I remember looking through magazines. Um, Facebook wasn't even a thing yet. So looking through magazines and seeing pictures of girls on stage in their heels and their sparkly bikinis. And I didn't know anything about it. I'm guessing it was even maybe the fitness division because it was so early figure would have just been starting. And I don't, so it could have even been the fitness division, but I remember seeing those girls on stage. And honestly, um, I, I saw their calf muscles, but this is going to sound kind of weird, but I saw their calf muscles and, I kind of have bigger calves and I've always, I was always made fun of it, fun of for it. You're, you have cows, not calves, you know? And so as a kid, that was so awful to me. And I saw their calves and I was like, they look like me. I can do like, I should do this. But I didn't actually start competing till 10 years later. I finally got involved and that's another story in itself, but finally got involved in 2011. It inspired me to become a better person altogether. Again, a whole nother story. Um, it's how I met my husband and it's just been nonstop ever since for the last decade. Well, as you can tell, cause you've watched the last few of my podcasts that calves are my number one problem area where I've always said I could inject pure muscle into my calves and they wouldn't even, you know, gain an ounce. So good God. But yeah, that's, that's awesome. Hey, anytime, you know, we have someone that has that, that with the calves, you know, that's a, that's a hit or miss thing. I mean, I, that's, but, but that's awesome. But what in what, what was that moment? Like when you decided to get into bodybuilding, was there, I mean, what was that whole process? Like where you're just like, Hey, I actually want to give this a shot. So I, um, I'm currently married to a wonderful man who I love dearly. Prior to this, I was, this is my second marriage. I was married very, very, very young. Um, 
and I had actually just gotten divorced. And like I said, early 2000s, which I was married at the time, I saw these pictures of these girls and I knew I was so intrigued by it. And once I got divorced, I was like, all right, it's time to do this for me. Like, and I just went at the time full force. I mean, thinking back, I definitely didn't go full force, but you think you are at the time. And I was all in and I found a coach and he helped me get started. Um, and actually even, he actually is the one who really got me um, cause I wanted to, and he approached me in the gym and said, have you ever competed? No, do you want to? Yes. And then, the, you know, then you get started. So I, I always thank, I'm thankful for that. Um, so yeah, I finally, it was kind of that final, like, it's time to make time for me and do something for myself. So were there any reservations that you had about the sport at all? Because I mean, there's so many myths that the general public has about the sport of bodybuilding. Was there anything that you were concerned about or did you just want to just take a full dive into it and just see where it went? Honestly, no, I can't say I had any reservations or any worries. Um, yeah, no, I, I really don't think I did. I went, I jumped right in and I was hundred percent. So, and when you were getting started, I mean, so many people do not understand that. I mean, I've always told some of my guests, you know, if you mention bodybuilding, they just go, oh, those are people that just work out a lot and they go on stage and they pose. And it's like, you got about 1% of it down. You got, you got some of the basics down, but I mean, there's just so much more to it, especially with the prep. I mean, what was that like when you went on your first prep? Because I mean, people think that they're in shape and that they're healthy. And then they go on the prep where then basically, I mean, everything has to be just so down point. And I mean, you have to get all of your workouts in, you have to get your sleep, you have to get your, all your nutrition. What was that like for you when you sort of jumped into that rabbit hole? I think the biggest thing for me, um, like I kind of mentioned, I was a personal trainer in a gym and I very much lived that lifestyle. Um, training wise, I trained all the time, ran, lifted, loved it. Right. Um, and I ate good, but I mean, I thought eating healthy for a long time, Yogurt, fruit, and string cheese was like my diet for a very long time. I lived off yogurt and fruit. Um, again, nothing really wrong with that, but I didn't touch that in my comp major competition days. Um, definitely enjoyed my weekend. Going to my parents' house and raiding their goodie cupboard on the weekends was a pretty normal thing. So, you know, just stopping all of those things that I never, I mean, I never really had issues with or anything, but I mean, it was easy to stop, but I definitely did. So <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I love to talk genetics on this podcast too, because everyone always has that one body part that really, really takes off that they don't have to train as much when they get started. And then they have that one body part that just legs behind. I know that your calves really took off. I don't want to even have you mention them again, cause I'm going to get even more jealous, but what was one body part that really dragged behind that you really had to sort of train to overdrive to get it to catch up? Um, Man, you know, honestly, I I don't feel like I've ever been the most genetically blessed in building muscle in a lot of places. And I would say my entire upper body for sure, to be completely honest. Um, I think back if wellness would have been around when I started 10 years ago, that probably would have been a very good division for me because I, I have done so many things to work on my shoulders and the width of my back. And I it, they've definitely improved over the years, 100%. But um, I just, I don't build muscle extremely easily. So it's taken a lot to get to where I have been um, size wise, but I would say definitely my shoulders are probably my weakest, but my whole upper body I struggle with. So, <laughs> Hey, you know, <laughs> Hey, muscle. Hey, you know, the calf, it, it even things out. That's what I like about most people's genetics is that it does even out. Now I have had one of those, I've had about a handful of those genetic freaks on where just everything is just you know, great. And I'm just like, okay, screw you. I hate you more than life itself. But you know, hey, you know, most of the time stuff does even out. But I mean, you sort of brought it up. And I mean, this is so much more of a mental sport than it is a physical sport. And most people do not understand that because they just see the physical results. They don't realize that, you know, the mental journey that this sport entails as well. And what has this been like for you mentally? And has it, you know, helped develop some mental strength for you? Because I've always made the comparison of you can compete in a show. I mean, you can basically do anything. No, absolutely. I, I, I mean, I touched on it. I mean, I, I like food as I think probably everyone comes on here and tells you that like, we all love food. It's not about, you know, a lot of people say like, Oh, I could never get on stage. I like food too much. Oh, believe me. I like food. Um, but the mental part of it is, so I always say if I can do it, anyone can do it truthfully. Um, but as I had kind of brought up, 
you know, I started competing a couple years after my divorce and I grew so going through a prep is one of the hardest things mentally and physically and emotionally. And if you can get through that, you start to learn, you can get through anything, literally anything in life. It's so mental, your business, your relationships, everything. Um, you have to want it. You don't just get it. You have to earn it. You have to put the work in every single day. You have to get up and make the choice to go to the gym, eat your food, cook your food. And that's the same with, again, everything in life. So you just learn how um, to that work ethic that you put into your prep, you can put into your whole life. And I think it improves your entire life if you can really make that connection, which is one thing I love about the sport so much and why I'm so passionate about it, because I work with a lot of men and women, but a lot of women who compete for the first time or have competed many times. And I get to watch them blossom and grow, not just their outside physical self. And yes, that's fun, but it's the inside stuff. That's just so cool. So. Well, and on top of, you know, especially working with women, I mean, I bring this up every podcast that the number one myth and stereotype that I love to bust on this podcast is that, you know, there's still so many women that unfortunately have that fear that if they, you know, even look at a weight when they walk into the gym, you know, they're going to put on 50 pounds of muscle overnight. And again, anyone, if that's ever happened to you, reach out to me. I will spend my entire life savings to train with you then. But I mean, obviously you didn't have that fear growing up because I mean, you were into health and fitness, you know, since like the age of seven, but how do you like to respond to that? Because I bet you still hear that all the time. I hear it every day. <laughs> Anytime I get a new client and I say this, I hesitate saying this, but I do want to say it because like you said, it's everyone says this to me. I build muscle so easy. I get bulky really easy. I don't want to get, you know, everyone feels that. And it's because we just don't have our, our nutrition really honed into where it should be. I actually, I did lift weights for I mean, literally my whole life, I've, I've been in the gym my whole life, but I still did have that feeling before I got into bodybuilding, even as a personal trainer, I lifted and I, I mean, and again, it's still a progression. You can't just start with squatting 135, but I would squat the bar or maybe put tens on the side and thought I was lifting heavy because I didn't want to get bulky. So like I kind of alluded to my legs and calves have always been a little more muscular and a little bit bigger. Well, I was very, very, very self-conscious of that. I still to this day have a very hard time wearing shorts. Um, but I did not fall in love with my legs until I started lifting as freaking heavy as I could and got my nutrition in check. As soon as I started doing that, it all came together. I could run and run and run and run and lift a little bit on my legs and I was never happy. So it's, it, it truly comes from the muscle you develop, but then you have to have your nutrition your nutrition is still always going to be key no matter what. So, so what advice do you have for anyone that's like saying that? Because I mean, uh, it's just, I, I honestly just almost want to just, just like strangle them and just be like, you do not understand the work that's going to actually require to actually put on some size. Oh, exactly. I mean, I've been in again, bodybuilding for just over 10 years, lifting as heavy as I can to put on as much muscle as I can. And I still don't have enough muscle. That's 10 years of so focused, dedicated nutrition, training, sleep, recovery, all of it. And I still am not big enough. So, um, and I look at like literal female bodybuilders or women's physique competitors who are just amazing. And I respect their dedication, but a lot of them have been doing it for over 20 years. Like you're not just going to step into the gym and like, that's a very, it's not an accident. You don't look like you don't look like a bodybuilder on accident. So you have to just get started. I try very hard. You know, I, I just try very hard to build trust before I just say, you got to listen to me. You know, I want to hear them and I want to, you know, know their background and their history. And then we just get started. And I don't usually start like full force. Like, again, let's go hit all these PRs and sign up for powerlifting me. Um, but if it progresses through that and that's what they want, great. But, you know, you just have to get started. And I, I mean, literally at one week, two weeks, women are coming back and just, I just feel so much better. Like you can just feel the changes immediately and your shape starts to change and then your metabolism starts to go up and you're, as you build a little bit more muscle, you can eat a little bit more food and then your metabolism starts to fire up and it just snowballs. So you just got to get started. And if you hate it after a month, then do something else. It's not, you don't have to do it, but just, just give it a shot. 
absolutely. And yeah, it's, and what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to put on size and it's like, then you just don't work out then. Then you don't have to work out then. And then you can just let it go. I, that's just one thing that I never got. But what was your friends and family's reaction? Like when you announced to them that like, Hey, I, I finally want to, you know, get, do a bodybuilding show. Honestly, I'm blessed with an amazing family who has been a hundred percent supportive. Always. I have, I have never, um, my immediate family who, um, yeah, they have never once, Oh, it's just one slice of pizza or it's just one cupcake. They have never, if I'm dieting, they don't, they'll still eat what they eat, but they don't ever like force it on me. And I know I'm very blessed in that, um, situation. I know many people who, who just had, you know, people in their lives who don't understand it. And that's honestly on them again. That's a whole nother, whole nother topic, but um, you still have to do you and just be happy with the choices you make and not let other people's um, views hurt you. But I've been very blessed. Um, and then I also tell people like once I got into bodybuilding and I knew it was not just one show, I knew it was going to be a lifestyle for me. I started like developing my life around that. Um, when I met my husband, I knew he would be supportive. I didn't start dating someone who didn't go to the gym or hadn't wanted to eat pizza. Like I knew it was important to me. And so I knew he would support and we would support each other in our ventures in bodybuilding and the nutrition and not eating out, not going on dates. Having So I think that's just so important is, you know, you don't get to always choose all of your family, but like you can choose your friends, your, you know, your significant others. And you just start to make, you just start to circle your life around what you want. And I mean, yeah, and that's and that's great too. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, I was guilted into yesterday because it's it was Memorial Day weekend. Everyone, for anyone who's wondering about the time, was I was guilted into having two two and a half to three hamburgers last night by my family. So you know, you know, everyone's family is a little bit different when it comes to that. So you know, but but yeah, but that's awesome that you have that support because yeah, like I've told so many people, I mean, having that support, you know, makes this ten times easier than it than it could be if you didn't have that support, and that's just. That is just so awesome. And I mean, when you were getting started in this sport, I mean, the number one thing that I would have never guessed in a million years is so much harder for a lot of these guests that I have on is that the posing. I mean, I never would have guessed it in a million years that for so many of these competitors posing, it's harder than your nutrition. It's harder than your training. What is your relationship and experience with posing been like? So when I started out, my coach gave me a DVD or actually maybe, no, I think it was a DVD of posing. And I watched that inside and outside, uh, like over and over and over. And I spent hours looking in the mirror. You know, I put up a second mirror in my bathroom and I just, I mean, for, I think I had that up for years and I just worked on that lat spread and worked on how to pose correctly. And I didn't nail it. It probably took me, I think I was going into my fourth show when the light bulb finally went off as to the back pose, right? Flaring your lats and getting to open up like, oh, that's what they're looking for. Like click, um, and I've heard you say this before, but it is just like riding a bike. As soon as you get it, you got it. Um, but posing is an ever-evolving thing. Um, I've competed 16 times, and I still don't feel like I've ever nailed my posing. But it is a constant evolution. And um, I like to split my shows up into my first round and my second round. So I competed 2011, 2012, 2013. I did, I believe, nine shows. I'm not exactly sure. I'm not going to do this. But I believe I did nine shows very quickly and I was not good in posing. I didn't know what I was doing. I just literally was like throwing my name in a hat, hoping I showed up. I thought you just needed to be skinny and show muscle. And I didn't really know. Well, I got really frustrated doing that. And so, and I spent a lot of money. <clears throat> and so I was like, you know what? I just need a break. So I took three years off. And in that three years, um, so my husband is um, a promoter of, NPC shows. Um, we are now the district chairs. He's the district chair of the NPC in our states. I'm his vice chair. Um, and so in those three years, he still like, I was still very involved with helping him promote the shows, run the shows, run the stages. And I just immersed myself into learning the history of bodybuilding, the history of the figure division, all of the things that I really didn't really know before. I just wanted to do it because I wanted to do it. I just wanted to I don't know. I just wanted to do it. And then I just, I learned and I spent the time understanding what the judges wanted and what the judges were looking for. Um, and in the meantime, became a judge myself. And now I'm a head judge and a national judge and posing to me now is the most fun thing. I love it. I love teaching it. I love teaching the stage. It is so much fun to go out there and just, um, get to have those few seconds 
to, I don't want to say show yourself off, but because it's not about that, but you know, you get well, to But like, let's be honest, you are, you are showing yourself, but it's, but it's not in that selfish kind of way that like people are thinking though. It's for a show, but it's just like, it's just like whenever I'd go out in the mountain and pitch. Yeah, I am showing myself off, but it's just pitching. It's yeah. Right, right. It's your sport and this is your time to shine and you're right. It is not a selfish thing, but it's like, you know, it's okay to be proud of your work and it's just so much fun. I love being on stage and I love teaching the stage. Um, and posing is so important. Um, I, I've worked at, thou I mean, maybe not, I mean, I've worked at so many shows. I, I have no idea how many shows and my husband and I will often like be back backstage. We're like, Oh, did you see that guy or this girl or whatever? We think, you know, she'll probably, win. and then someone else wins and you're like, how did that person not win? And then you look at pictures and you're like, Oh, they, you know, they can present themselves in a way to show the judges what they need to see. So it is so important. Um, obviously each show you do, you get more and more and more involved in what you need to do posing. And then as your physique changes, you need to continue to evolve your posing too. It's never the same. It's never the same. It's always a little bit different. Absolutely. I mean, it's always ever evolved. And you mentioned that you knew like the history of the figure division. What is the history of it? Cause I've always been fascinated by the figure division because I mean, it's like you have to wear the heels too, like the bikini competitors but you look a lot, I mean, you're a lot more denser than the, than the bikini competitors as well. And it's, you know, just a step. So what is that whole history with that? Because I've always been fascinated specifically by that. Cause I mean, it's like, you're like a lot more, I'm not going to say a lot more in shape than the bikini, competitors, but it's like, you're just a step below physique. And I've always just been fascinated by that. So when bodybuilding started, you know, and my husband will say this, he, when he started promoting shows, there was men's bodybuilding and women's bodybuilding and I believe women's fitness, right? So you had, as a female, you had bodybuilding, which at the time there, I mean, and there still are different weight divisions. So it's not like you need to be a heavyweight bodybuilder. Same with guys, you could be a lightweight or a bantam weight um, and have different divisions there. But um, as that started to progress and you know, the bigger muscle wins, well, not every female wants that. Um, and Fitness is so, I mean, I love the fitness division, but goodness gracious, I can bear, I can really stand up some days, much less do a cartwheel, much less do the stuff that they're incredible is my favorite. Um, but yeah, a lot of people can't do that. So you had bodybuilding and fitness. Well, what's next? So that's when figure came around. Um, initially figure had the one piece and the two piece suits. Obviously they did away with the one piece, but um, I believe it started in 2001. I believe that was the first year, give or take, please don't quote me on that, but I believe it's around 10 years or excuse me, 20 years old now. And, um, so that was the beginning of it. It was just kind of that stepping stone before women's bodybuilding. Well, again, obviously as everything progresses, um, after figure came bikini and women's physique, um, bikini being that gateway division that figure used to be, but it just evolved over time. Um, women's physique being again, another stepping stone between figure and bodybuilding. Um, and I believe everything has its place and even wellness now it's like, Oh, another division. But if you really look, if you really look at these women, I again, wish now I would have had a picture of all the, the divisions for women. They each have their own very specific place. And I've had girls, I shouldn't say me specifically. I've known girls. I've talked to girls who like bikini pros, um, who have had to starve themselves to fit into bikini, literally, um, but they weren't right for figure. Um, so that's where wellness comes into play. It's when, and I've talked to so many girls now who have been like, oh, do I stay in bikini or do I go to wellness? I just don't know. And I ask them, I, you know, what does your body want to do? Do you want to train harder? You know, sometimes with bikini, you have to train a certain way to stay in the division. But if your body wants to, why don't you let it, you know, that's what these divisions are for, for women. So you don't have to try to fit into a certain box and like do unhealthy things to get there. Um, on either end of the spectrum, you can find what your body is very happy and healthy at. And, and then that's for you. So I could go on and on, but I, Oh, absolutely. And that, and that, and that was great too. And I mean, being that you've been in this sport for such a long period of time, I've, you know, all the guests that I've had on that have been in the sport for a significant amount of time, they talk about, you know, like how the divisions are always ever changing. Like if you were to look at someone who was a figure competitor 10 years ago, they might not even have placed in a bikini in a bikini show right now. So what has that been like for you? Just seeing how everything has just evolved and taken shape. Oh, hundred percent. Even from when I won my pro card till now figure is like a totally different division. And I, um, after I did win my pro card four years ago already, um, I, 
I, I, my body, I had a lot of issues and I, um, haven't really competed much since I did compete once, but it wasn't very, it just, it, it's very hard to keep up with that level. And, um, but yeah, four years ago, it was, it was a whole different place. The figure division is taken off and those girls are freaking amazing. Um, I do hope to step on stage again, but um, from when I first started competing, you know, you look, look back at like the Nicole Wilkins and the Aaron Stearns and the Avon Collins when I first started to now the Sydney Gillens and the Candace Carters and um, Natalia Soltero, who um, actually, when she, I got second to her when she won her pro card. And so it's been fun watching her just like explode into this amazing figure competitor. I've always kind of stayed in touch with her. And um, those girls are just amazing. They're so fun to watch. But I, I do feel um, my body is a little bit happier where it was even quite a few years ago. It's, it's, it's a lot for me to put on that amount of muscle. And I, I'm not willing to, that's just, yeah. I'm no, I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I know, but, I know, <laughs> I know, yeah. No, abso- absolutely. And that's just, yeah, I mean, just, it's just, it's just fascinating to see, you know, the changes that have been taking on in this sport. And I mean, I, now we got to talk about the coronavirus. Cause I mean, it's been one thing that's impacted our lives in more ways than we could have ever have imagined. I mean, what was your experience like during this whole, you know, pandemic, especially with the gym shutting down and everything. And I mean, it's the moment that the gym's closed, I was like, Oh God, these bodybuilder friends of mine. I was like, what are they going to do? It's like, it's like a drug addict without their crack or something like that. So you got to, things become interesting. So what was this whole experience like for you? So, um, my husband has spoiled me. We are very fortunate. We've always had a big gym at our place out here. So me specifically, um, we were able to still train as normal. We've got a stair mill, a treadmill, a bike, and I mean, a very, very good sized shop that's full of gym equipment. Um, but like I kind of mentioned, my husband does promote shows and that was probably the biggest hit for us. We were three, two or three weeks out of a show and then five weeks out of the next show when everything just shut down and they were on track to be some of the biggest shows we've had in our area in a couple of years. And we were so excited. And I mean, my, my husband and I, I mean, I do too, but my, like we put so much into those shows and to just have them just pulled the rug out from underneath us and all these competitors that have been working so hard for so long to get on that stage. And it was just heartbreaking. So my husband, um, postponed the shows and he was able to still have them that fall, but they were probably a third of the size they were going to be. And it's still just been a struggle to get the shows back up and running. And he puts on the, I mean, yes, I'm probably biased. He's my husband, but I've helped out at a lot of shows. I've been to a lot of shows and he puts so much into these shows. So, um, they truly are for the athletes. A lot of people say that, but his, his, yeah. Um, so we're just really trying to build that back up, to be honest, that's been what's probably hit us the hardest. Yeah. I mean, I I can't imagine what that's been like too. And, you know, as things have sort of been getting closer back to normal or things sort of back to where you can have like full shows and stuff where it looks like it was kind of like in maybe 2019. Right. Right. Um, we're hoping this year. So we did have a show earlier this year, but that was pretty small. We had a lot of restrictions. Um, he still did put on shows last fall where we couldn't even have an audience. And then last minute we could have like 30 people in the audience, which it's like, but you know, we, he, he refused to cancel them because he wasn't going to make money. He still had shows for people. And, um, yeah, we're really optimistic now for this next year and hoping that we can get things up and running again. And and absolutely and i mean i wish you guys nothing but the best of luck in that because i mean yeah it is such an important thing that people do not really i mean on this podcast specifically we never really talk too much about the promoters but yeah they are just such an integral part of the whole bodybuilding sport and i mean without them there wouldn't even be a sport so make sure that everyone you go and thank your promoter especially when they're when they're running their shows but i mean since you've had experience being a judge too as well one of the big complaints that I always that I always say is that I do wish though that the judges would be a little bit more impartial because let's be honest, any sport where you have humans judging other humans, there's going to be human error in it. Don't even get me started on baseball umps when I was when I was pitching because that's a whole different subgenre in of itself. But I mean, it's like if you were to take one bodybuilder for a show one week and then two weeks later they might be like, oh, we want you a little bit more of a leaner look, a little bit more of a fuller look. It's just so when you're a judge, I mean how do you, do you like to communicate with the other judges in order to get like an overall look of what you guys would want? Or what is it like being a judge for a sport? Like, how do you guys like to communicate? Like, what's that whole process like? Yeah. So in our area, my husband makes sure that before you're a judge, he wants you to test judge for two years to make sure you 
are up to date with what we want in the sport, right? Um, my husband, you know, and then you go, you want to stay involved at a national level and even really watching the pros. So you're watching what those top, top, top shows are, what's winning, right? And then we take that to a local level and you're never going to see a pro physique on a local stage. So that's what makes it really hard. You look at the Olympia winners and that is 100% what those top judges will tell you. That's what they are looking for. I'm never going to look like that though. I will try my hardest. I'm never, gonna I'm never going to look like, like, I'm never going to look like Phil Heath. I'm so, sorry, everyone. Yeah. It's, it's just it's, not going to happen. Know, <laughs> but at the end of the day, outside of wellness, wellness is a little different because we do want a little more muscle in the lower half, but really every division, um, Again, this is a little bit of touch and go because there's still a few differences, of course, in every division. But at the end of the day, I'd like to say bodybuilding is obsessed with the letter X. At the end of the day, we want to see width through the shoulders. We want to see that V taper into the tiniest waist possible. And then we want to see the full quads, the glutes, the hamstrings, right? We really do want to see that shape. Okay, so that's what we're looking for, even in bikini. And again, it's a little different. I mean, yes, bikini is not men's bodybuilding, but we're still looking for that taper, a waist. And then, of course, glutes are huge. <laughs> no pun intended. But, you know, glutes, glutes are a big part, the glute hamstring. Sometimes women ask me why that's so important, because it's like, you know, why? And truthfully, glutes, especially actually hamstrings, but glutes and hamstrings, I feel are the hardest place for a woman to build muscle, number one, and then get lean enough, number two. So if you can do that, you're the rep. So that's why it is such a, it, it's a gateway, it's a gateway division. They want anyone to be able to compete in bikini and not have to train for 20 years to do it. But you still have to do some training. You still have to have muscle. You still have to get lean. Those girls are very, I mean, they're not shredded like women's physique, but they are very lean and they are, you know, conditioned. So we are looking for that shape. Um, when I give judges feedback, I always try, especially if I know this is a first time competitor, I like to give the three things that we look for that give an overall package. The shape, like I just said, the shape for the division, the muscle shape, which also includes muscle size a little bit. I'm going to use myself as an example. If I say that I want to look like an X when I stand in my figure pose, my genetics, I look more like an H. I have very narrow shoulders. I have a pretty boxy wide waist. I don't have a tiny little pinched waist. And then I have narrow set hips. So I literally pretty much go straight up and down. Now I have friends who literally without muscle go like this. They've got wide shoulders, a teeny tiny little waist, and then wider set hips. So they're just genetically set to look like an X. So I'm going to have to build more muscle to look like an X than they might. So that's where I might be told I need more muscle when I already have more muscle than the next girl. So why am I being told I need more muscle? Well, it's because I need to build that shape. She might not need that. Now you put more muscle on her. She's going to be like, oh my gosh. Right? So shape is number one. The second thing is conditioning. You have to have the proper conditioning for each division. I'm not going to get into that for each division. Look at your Olympia winners and that will tell you. I can go into it more, but I'm not going to. But conditioning for the division. And then the third thing is um, proportions and symmetry. And this is where women's wellness is a little off on the proportions because we do want a little more muscle on the legs. But I don't, as a bodybuilder, as a figure competitor, I don't want to look at someone and go, Oh my gosh, look at her shoulders or, oh my gosh, look at her quads. I want to say, oh my gosh, look at her. Like, I don't even know where to look because she's so balanced. Nothing overpowers the next front to back, top to bottom, side to side. Um, all three of those things are just as important as the next. One does not over, you know, being conditioned is not better than being big and being big is not better. than. So now we're looking for the one person that has all three things. Very rarely is there that person, especially at a local stage. So now we have to decide who fits that the best, who brings the most to the table to have that overall package. Um, so when I give feedback, I just, I don't go that much in detail, but I list those three things and I say, all not one is more important than the next. And then I like to explain what they, what their strengths are and what they're lacking in those three things and what they need to work on. Well, and I mean, then we go into posing yeah. Jeez. <laughs> presentation, but. 
oh my god, that is, yeah. I mean, that is, I mean, I'm more of a T-shape myself, too, where it's, you know, upper body than my legs and my lower body are just absolutely shot. So, you know, I, I have that T thing, rock. But no, it's just, that is just so awesome. And one thing that I've heard so many times that just, it makes me just want to, you know, wring my brains out is, you know, if someone comes in and they're just so much more better than everyone else that like, but then they want everyone else to, it's kind of like everyone else is sort of brought in a package where like, if someone is exponentially so much more better, they might not win because like they, everyone else brings like a symmetry thing. What is the reasoning behind that? Cause I've heard that a couple of times too, where I've, and I've even seen it on some photos that I've saw where like one person is just so much better than everyone else, but they just brought a package that was, that no one else really brought but then they might not do as well. That's very, very tough. And if we're talking on a local stage, like a state level, any national fall thing that we're not talking nationals or pro level, right? We're talking local shows, most of the people competing. I don't believe if someone is going to do well at nationals, they should 100% win a show. Like if someone is told, oh, you're too good for this level, you need to go to nationals and they don't do well or win at that show if they're told they're too big for a local stage. I don't, I, it, you know, everything is so situational. Um, if they truly are too big, then they need to be told you need to go to women's physique. Like if you're too big for figure, you need to go to women's physique. And then that's, you know, then that's correct that they maybe shouldn't win. Um, or same in bikini. If your legs are too big, maybe you should go to wellness. But if you, you know, I've, I've seen situations where someone's told eh, you're too lean for bikini. And then that same girl goes to nationals and she places top five. I mean, that. That's why judges need to stay up with their national level shows. And my husband and I are so like, we don't want to see bad, you know, and I feel like it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, but that is something that I've heard in the past and I don't. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've heard some figure comparisons be like, oh, they said that they've came in way too hard and then they go and they place, you know, like you said, like top five or, and it's just, again, it's just with human, with human error. That's that there's going to be like that in every single sport. So you just got to <laughs> now. I will say though, you start talking nationally, I've seen girls, you know, cause there is a line of being too lean or too hard and those top national level judges, I trust them 110%. I feel there is, I mean, you know, people talk politics or what, nope. I really, I know those judges and I know, like I've, I know them. They judge very, very, very fairly. If they feel you're too lean, you're too lean. If they feel like you're too hard or big, you need to listen to them. Um, but it also, yes, depends on who all shows up. Sometimes you bring that same package and you just end up being the best on stage. Sometimes you bring that same package that they liked and then someone else better shows up. Well, like, and it's all about like who shows up too. Cause like I could compete in a show and if I, there might be a situation where I might win one, even though I'm not in the best shape either, just because everyone else is in such poorer shape than me too. So it really just depends on that too as well. I always, and I got this actually from my coach who I used for many years. Um, he said this in a post once, but Sometimes the only reason you win, well, actually, literally, the the only reason you ever win is because no one better showed up. I am not the best in the world. The times I've won shows is because literally no one better showed up. Until you're Miss Olympia or Mr. Olympia, you are not the best in the world. So you better just, hope, you know, you want to just, it's got to be your day on stage. You are the best. The judges like you. You get your panel of judges that like your physique, and it's your day. Especially when you're going for a pro card or a pro win. Like, you, the stars have to kind of align to a point, too. But, um... But yeah, then you're the best in the world and you have to you have to keep there. So you gotta keep but Well, and I mean talking about pro cards, I mean I always ask any of my guests on here that have won their pro card, what was that moment like for you when they announced your name and you realized, oh my god, I'm a pro now? Because for so many people out there, I always just like to point out that this is the highlight for so many of the competitors' journeys because that's the affirmation that you know all that hard work that they've put into, you know, this lifestyle has finally paid off. And what was that moment like for you when they announced your name and you realized, oh my god, I'm a pro now? You know, I came real close a couple times and then when it finally happened, it was, it was just kind of a, like, I'll never forget waking up the next morning and just like a weight had lifted off my shoulders. Like, okay. Like I finally can say I did it. Um, you know, I, I had a lot of hopes and dreams once I got my pro card. And then, like I said, I, I've just had some issues with life and like body and hasn't been able to train like I need to to be a pro um but I sure as heck did leading up to that I trained like a pro I thought of myself like a pro I ate like a pro I did everything like a pro to become a pro um and I started it's it's a lot of work and it was just that like ha, huh, like I did it I'm so happy I cried on stage um 
yeah, there, it's pretty cool to hear those, you know, IFBB pro letters before your name. So. Absolutely. And I mean, two of the things that I always love to talk about on this podcast as well. I mean, cardio is my trigger word. I hate it more than life itself. And I mean, I'm talking about actual running when it comes to walking. I can do that, you know, all day, every day. What is your current relationship like with cardio? Because unfortunately, when you get into health and fitness, I mean, you do sort of sign a deal with the devil when it comes to cardio. It is what we signed up for. And I, please don't hate me, but I actually really enjoy cardio because I really like, like, I like sweating. I like feeling that. um, Oh, don't get, don't get me wrong. If it's like walking and me running, walking and sweating, then I'm totally fine with that too. It's like the actual, like people that like, oh, I do marathons. I was like, oh, that's a mental illness. Cause I, why would you want to run for that long? So yeah. Yeah. yeah, No, I, yeah, definitely have never done a marathon. I have done a half marathon, but not a marathon. And, um, I don't know. I think, um, I, I do enjoy like sprinting and some of those kinds of things. I don't do it as much anymore, but, um, Cardio has never been a super big issue to me, but, um, I do, when I work with people, I always say, you know, I don't want you to rely on cardio for your fitness. Um, because that can be a scary slope if you're doing an hour a day, just to maintain, like you gotta do an hour a day. So you want to try to, you know, limit that to a point. Like I enjoy it. So I do, I don't, I wouldn't say I do it every day, but five to six days a week, I still get up and do fasted cardio just because I enjoy waking up that way. But, um, you don't want to get in the habit of like having to do it. You know, you, you enjoy a holiday, you have enjoy time with your family, have maybe an extra, you know, have your burger, whatever. Well, you don't want to have to like, like you want to be able to do cardio to help that. Not because you have to do cardio every day. It's definitely a tool. It's definitely something we sign up for. It is good for your heart. It's good for your lungs. It's good for your mind. I don't think it should be excessive. Absolutely. And I mean, yeah, we've heard some horror stories on here of like, yeah, you got to do like your two hours of cardio, you know, right every day before showing. It's like, come on. It's like, come on. But I mean, the most important part of this lifestyle, I don't care what anyone says is sleep. And for anyone that disagrees with me on that, I tell them pull an all nighter and then try to work out and tell me how that works out twice in college. I did that. And both times I lasted about halfway through and I just said, screw this. I'm going back to sleep or going to try to get some sleep at least. But what is your relationship with sleep like? Because I mean, I have, like, we're talking about genetic freaks. I've had some of those, like, weird people that can, like, get, like, three hours of sleep a night, and then they're like, yeah, I'm totally fine. Like, I can go. And then I've had the other ones, like, the normal people that need, you know, like, the eight to nine or the seven hours. Where do you fall on that? And is there anything that you do to try to get that proper amount of sleep? Because, I mean, especially in this day and age with technology and everything, so many people, I think, struggle when it comes to getting that proper amount of sleep. Yeah. Um, Again, another area, I I wasn't blessed with the best muscle building or shape genetics, but I was blessed with sleep genetics. I can sleep anytime, anywhere, no problem. I've never really had an issue with sleep. Sometimes it's, it's yes, finding, or I often tell my clients, like, you have to be selfish with your sleep. You can't stay up an extra hour and clean because you just need to clean. Like, if you want to see improvements, like you have to get your rest, you have to prioritize it. Um, Stay off your phone. I know that's hard, but stay off your phone before bed. Um, I, I know when I was training real hard and again, my husband was just a saint putting up with me through all of this, but I would a lot of times stretch 30 to even 45 minutes before bed every single night. The prep, when I won my pro card, I stretched so much and focused on recovery so much. And I think that helped so much because, you know, you have to work really hard to get to that level. And I did. And, and rest and recovery is just huge. It's very important. I mean, that is, I've always compared it to like one of the best feelings you can ever have on the planet is if you get that like long, hard workout in, then you get that proper amount of sleep where you wake up feeling like a superhero. I mean, it's just that, that feeling is like bar none, one of the best feelings ever. But I mean, on top of all this too, what advice would you have for someone who is just thinking about getting started to get back into the shape of things, especially because of like COVID where a lot of people, I mean, let's be honest, you put on your, you know, five to 15 pounds of COVID weight. I'm still currently working on, you know, getting that last five pounds of my COVID, my COVID weight off a little bit, but what advice do you have for people looking to just get started again? Because I mean, so many people, I think they just don't understand that, you know, once you take that first step in the gym, it's so hard to take it out. And then also I do have those friends that go full on Rambo where it's like, yeah, I'm going to go train for three hours a day for like a week. And then it's like, yeah, then they last a week. Cause then it's like, yeah, your body's going to be absolutely sore. So what advice do you have for people just to get started? Right. Um, you know, I think exactly what you said, like there's a, there's kind of a ceiling to everything. So if you just jump in head first and try to say, I'm going to train two hours a day. I'm going to do an hour of cardio. I'm going to eat perfect. And you set your standards here. Like there's a ceiling to everything. You're probably going to get results if you work out three or even two to four times a week. And because if you're not working out at all, even two times is a lot. 
and you know, being realistic about your food goals. Yes, it's so important, but just getting on a plan and being consistent with your water and being consistent with your food, it does, like you just have to get started. Um, and yeah, if you know, after COVID, I mean, yeah, we all went, oh man, this, uh, yeah, last year. We, we all, all basically years, blacked out for a year. Let's be honest. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, now that gyms are definitely open and things are starting to happen and like it's summer. So you want to wear, you know, the summer clothes. Um, and this is like my own self. One of the best things I like to advise people to do, it's free. It's easy. You can do it anywhere. Is just get your water intake up, whatever you're currently drinking, increase it by another liter or double it if you can. Um, because water is such an important part of your metabolism. It helps food get to your muscles. So the muscle can use the food. You know, a lot of times we hear, you know, we have to drink water. It's so important, but we don't understand why. So I, always tell my, teach my clients what water actually physically does in your body. Um, and then that helps them want to drink their water. So water, if you want to get started, just focus on your, even just focusing on your water. Sometimes people will already start to feel a difference because their food is actually properly moving through their system to their muscle, getting used as glycogen, not getting stored as fat. Um, so that's my biggest, and it's, I mean, te- you know, typically free or very, very cheap and very easy. Anyone can do it at anytime i will have to add on to that though be ready though you are going to be going to the bathroom a lot more that's that's one thing that i struggled with with this whole lifestyle when i started really getting it's like you are going to be getting up a couple of times probably in the middle of the night and you're gonna you know yeah you're i mean you're not gonna be the you're not gonna be the most fun person on car road trips basically you're gonna be like that person like hey can you pull yeah that's one thing that i learned but hey you know it's it is great and for anyone that's living in you know the upper midwest where we have a lot of lakes i go kayaking too and that's one of the best back workouts you'll ever get in your entire life so just and people just got to realize too that like lifting weights doesn't have to be the be all end all when it comes to being in shape i mean i have friends that do yoga i have friends that go that are cyclists i have friends that you know it's just not it's just about finding what works best for you and so that that's one thing i think out of anything that i could really put out there i would but if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, we made the decision, you can change one thing about the sport of bodybuilding and everyone would go along with it. What would be one thing that you'd like to see changed? Um, can I have two things? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I would say absolutely. The first thing is that it wasn't so expensive that for too, people to yeah. get into. <laughs> well, I'd say, I'd, say that they, I'd say that people would actually make money then as opposed to, cause people don't understand you guys are losing money doing this. Yeah. I've spent tens of thousands of dollars. My early years of competing, I was just trying to be as cheap as I could and not spend money. And finally, when I came back and competed for the second time, I was like, you just, you have to go. You have to spend the money. If you're going to try to do well, you just have to, you have to stay in close hotels or good hotels or host hotels. You have to fly out two or three days early. You can't try to cheat. You just have to spend the money. Um, And it is, it's just very expensive, but it's so worth it. Like it is, it is more than just a trophy. The journey is all worth it. But, um, so yeah, the expense of it is, is one. Um, but I would maybe say a little bit is, um, I think bodybuilders get a little bit of a bad rap that we are selfish and into ourselves and, um, you know, Oh, look at me, look at me. Which, you know, kind of like we talked about with posing. I mean, there's a little bit of that, like, I'm proud of the work I've done when I step on stage. But it's not like, oh, I'm in a bikini on the beach. Look at me. It's like, this is my art type of a thing. Um, I would say 95% of the bodybuilders I've ever met, um, bikini competitors all through men's bodybuilders, are some of the kindest, nicest, most genuine people who want you to do well. Like, you Yes, they look intense in the gym and I would maybe not talk to them in the middle of their workout, but if you catch them before or after, they will give you all the advice in the world, be more than willing to talk to help you get started or help you figure out what you can do or point you in the right direction or whatever it is, because we've all been through something that's gotten us into the sport. And usually it's something that's been some sort of, um, you know, a self-isolating thing or um, a trauma self- usually. Yeah. Or something yeah, like that. yeah something. Yeah. And we've all had, it's all helped us overcome that and just feel so much more empowered. And like, I want more people to feel that too. And I'm more than willing to help. So like, that's something I wish more people um, didn't think that they're just, oh, these like mean people in the gym. Like, yeah, you can get kind of focused in your workouts, but I can about guarantee if you talk to that person before or after their workout, don't interrupt their workout, but they are some of the kindest people you will ever meet. 
I agree with you 1000%. I do have to also have to ask, yeah, don't do it when they're doing their workout because it's like, first of all, why would you do that? And second of all, in college, that happened a couple of times where people come up to you and I'd be like, okay, I will be as nice to you as possible. It's like, don't do it when I'm doing like mid bench press and like come up to me and like be, ask me advice. Cause like, I'm already struggling enough as it is here, guys. It's like, cut me some slack, but yeah, abs- I mean, there's some of the most humble people on the planet and yeah, it's like, that's just their me time that they go in. Yeah. There, there's so many misconceptions. I mean, I might even do a whole podcast where I'm just talking about the myths that a lot of people have about the sport, but if we were to talk to you a year from today, where would you like to be at just in your health and fitness journey, just in your overall life? What are some goals that you'd like to have achieved? So, I mean, I would like to step on stage again. I, um, after my pro debut, uh, which was two years ago already, and it just, that was of all my preps I've ever had, that was my worst. It was very, very rough on just I had so much going on and I maybe shouldn't have even done the show, but um, I would like to step on stage one more time to kind of make that right. I know I can do better than how I showed up that day. Um, but that's not really my entire goal anymore. I mean, I used to have Olympia goals. I mean, who, what pro doesn't, that's always like, get your pro card, go to the Olympia. Eh, I'm kind of past that, but I, I, I have gotten into judging more. I love judging. I love giving back to the sport and I am a, um, a national judge and a head judge, but I would love to become an IFBB pro judge. So that's kind of my next goal, whether that happens or not. I don't, you know, I, I still have a lot of, um, it, you know, it's just, uh, ladders to climb to get to those levels. But um, I hope to judge more nationally and help keep giving back. I just am so passionate about it and I love it. And um, I think for me, I spent so many years trying to figure out what judges want. And it's so clear to me now that I, I want to help other people understand that because I know it's so hard, especially as a new athlete, when you don't fully understand, like, what are the judges looking for? Like, I want to help people understand that. So, um, so yeah, but that's my goal is to, is to judge more in, and be an judge. Well, and I think just especially getting behind the the camera basically is so much. It makes it so much easier to realize what judges want. Because I remember I was listening to a podcast with Olivia Wilde, the actress, and she talked about how she got started in a casting agency, and so she realized, you know, like what casting agents want. And I think if people really got started, you know, maybe in the in the judging thing, then you realize like, oh, this is what they want. So that helps out as well. But one last judging question I had: so what is the process like to get into being an IFBB pro judge? Is it like do you have to have like tryouts, or what's that whole process like to all of a sudden get promoted to that? Yep, yep. So like I kind of mentioned. Um, the NPC has different districts and my husband is the head, uh, the district chair of the, uh, Minnesota, North Dakota district. And he, so district chairs can promote local judges as they see fit. My husband, um, requires two years or a certain amount of shows for test judging. Um, and then you have to have a certain score for that test judging. You don't just do it and then you're in, like you have to make sure your scores are at least 90% or better. Um, so once you've been judging for a while, then a district chair can um, suggest you to become a national judge. In order to be a head judge locally, you have to be a national judge. So when my husband took over the district, he and I both test judged nationally right away. Um, and you just, and it's the same thing. You have to test judge. And it's one thing to test judge locally, nationally. Those are big shows. And you have to sit through the entire show, like, if you're judging a show, they usually have you judge a couple classes, not even a full division sometimes, just to give your eyes a break. And it's there's a lot of people in the well, nationals last year. I mean, well, especially those bikini year, shows too, where it's like those things take 10 hours in and of themselves. Yeah. And you have to sit through all of them. Like sometimes they'll switch out judges every two divisions because there's 40 people in the class. So, anyways, you sit and you test judge. My eyes were kind of like this by the end, but um, Fortunately, I was able to pass on my first go around. So I only had to do it once. And um, Sandy actually called me and was like, you did really well. We think you'd be a great head judge. Um, and I was like, that was like probably one of the top five moments of my life. So, but um, I, so now it's going to be uh, judging more nationally. And then once they feel like you're ready, um, they actually would just promote you to an IP judge. That is, so. yeah, that is absolutely awesome. And yeah, again, you guys, I mean, we cannot thank Kathy enough for coming on and for, you know, sharing your stories or anyone that you'd like to give a shout out to before we wrap things up. Oh, well, I mentioned him a few times, my husband, <laughs> um, you know, through all ups and downs. And well, life. you better mention him after he gives you that good of a setup in the background. Are you kidding me? Right? That's like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, um, so Thomas Kemper is my husband. He, um, yeah, through all yeah, through all of it, he has been there and supported me. Um, and I, I can only hope I do the same for him. My family is amazing. My um, 
sorry, family, mom, dad, sister, brother, um, sister, mom, brother-in-law. And then, um, you know, cause again, they, they are so good to me. Um, my sponsors, um, H and I nutrition.com. They, I love them. They stand for honesty and integrity nutrition. Um, they're not just going to try to sell you a bunch of stuff. They will really listen. And I mean, truthfully, I know those people so very well and I love representing them. Um, Metroflex gym. I do have a gym set up here, but I have an amazing, we are so fortunate in Fargo to have a Metroflex. It is the best gym. If you're in the area, please go visit, get a membership. It is the best app. Like the atmosphere in that gym is crazy. You will not go there and not work hard. Um, and then a quarter turn to the right is my suit sponsor. Um, I've worked with her for, uh, five, four or five years. Um, the best suits. I will put her up there with anyone in the world. Olympia level suit. She's done suits on the Olympia stage, but she will work with a beginner as well. She is the best. So quarter turn to the right. Oh yeah. No, sorry, everyone. My dog was literally scratching at my door and whining, wanting to come in. So I'm letting her in. She, oh, yep, she's sniffing around in my room, but yeah, I, we got a little cab. But yeah, that is odd. Quarter Turn to the Right is one of the best names I could have ever think for a super. I mean, they, they just nailed that down pat, but and yeah, that is awesome. She does do everything, she, yeah. not just like figure suits. You yeah. know, Quarter Turn to the Right is she does bikini in even into men's bodybuilding, so absolutely. And and yeah, in Metroflex, I've had a couple of guests on from Fargo, and they do they they all go there too. So, I mean, yeah, everyone, if you're even in that area, if you're in the Moorhead area too, and all that stuff, you know, go down there and check it out. But again, you guys, we cannot thank Kathy enough for coming on and you know, sharing her story and talking all things health and fitness with us. And again, Kathy, thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I'm glad we finally, after a couple of years, got it to work. <laughs> hey, you know, and, and it's gonna it, it, we're gonna get it back on quicker than that. We'll have you on in a year now, but yeah, no, that's that, but that's gonna be awesome. So, again, you guys, everyone go and check her out. I'll leave a link to her Instagram page down below and a link to all of her sponsors as well. And you can all check that out. And this is Ryan Johnson, DD on the spot, signing off. Have a great day, everyone. <laughs>